Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examinations perspective. So today, we are going to discuss the Hindu Delhi edition dated 14th January 2023. The important topics have been listed on your screen and a timestamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now, let us start today's session. This topic has appeared at page number 10 and is about one of the most pressing concerns which India faces in today's time. The concern is the child marriage. The topic reads marriage of the minor girls, Supreme Court to check the legality of the personal law. The immediate context of this very topic is that recently the Supreme Court decided to examine whether the girls as young as 15 years can enter into the wedlock on the basis of customs or the personal laws when such marriages constitute an offence in the statutory law. Now, yes, I do agree that most of us understand this fact and know that the girls before the 18 years of age and boys before 21 years of age cannot marry in India. But still, there are certain exceptions to it. And this whole topic is about the child marriage in this very regard. As far as the UPSC scheme of syllabus is concerned, this topic is very important when it comes to the General Studies Mains Paper 2 in the section of Social Justice. More precisely, the UPSC mentions the laws and the institutions constituted for the vulnerable sections. Here, we will discuss about the laws as well as about the institutions which here are talking about the one of the most vulnerable sections which is the children. So now let us begin our discussion. First of all, we should understand that what exactly do we mean by child marriages in India. According to the Prevention of Child Marriage Act, that is PCMA 2006, the person who is below the 18 years of age, if she is a girl, or the person who is below the 21 years of age, if he is boy, are considered to be a children in India. They are child. Okay, now we all know that child marriages are banned in India, but there are certain disturbing facts and data which are related to India. The first is that around 24 million of children are married below this statutory age limits in India. Around 40% of the world's 60 million child marriages takes place in India. Now this is a very huge number. In last five years, there is a positive trend that the child marriage in India has declined by 3.5%, but still the rate is approximately 23 to 24%. Now when we see the percentages, it is very low, but you have to convert this into absolute numbers that India has around 130 crores population. And now just imagine the number of the child marriages which are taking place in India. There are huge regional variations also which are witnessed in terms of child marriage. For example, the tribal states like Jharkhand experiences very high child marriages. According to the National Family Health Service 5, out of the total women aged between 20 to 24 years, 32% of these women were married below the 18 years of age. Similarly, the disturbing trend is observed in Assam. There, compared to 2015, the rate of child marriages in 2019 has rather increased. Similarly, the states like Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Haryana, though they have experienced overall decline in the child marriages, but still the rates of child marriages in these states are also very high. Similarly, when we talk about the state of Kerala, now, Kerala is one of the states which is an exception here because we know that the southern states generally perform better when it comes to the social indicators. For example, Kerala has one of the highest literacy rates. But still, when it comes to the child marriages, a very high number of child marriages is also taking place in state of Kerala. So first of all, till now we have discussed that what do we mean by child marriage? And what are certain disturbing facts and data related to child marriages in India? Now we should think about the fact that despite the increase in overall literacy rate, increase in employment levels, better income status, and we all know that 
by and large we are moving towards more modern and progressive society but still this issue of child marriage pertains in india what are the various reasons for this the first and the foremost reason is the poverty now in india there is a huge financial cost which is borne by parents while raising their children and more importantly we know that the society in which we live it is mainly a patriarchal society so this financial burden if it is being spent on boy then most of the families are okay with it but when it comes to the spending on girls then most of the families consider their girl babies as a liability and because of this financial burden they think that they should get rid of their girls however this is not only true for girls even boys also face discrimination in this regard because of the poverty the boys are expected to go out of their house and earn the living bread for themselves as well as their families and that is how the mentality of the family changes the family begins to think that now because the boy is earning we should get him married also so the poverty is one of the factor which is leading to the child marriages in india for girls as well as boys the second important reason is the patriarchal setup of our society as we have discussed that girls are considered as liability so similarly we also understand that girls are also considered in our society as someone else's property which in hindi we call as paraya dhan so because of this very fact because the girls are considered as someone else's property so why not to marry them as soon as possible because they do not belong to our family they belong to someone else's family so this is basically the mind setup which the patriarchal families or the societies have and hence it also gradually or eventually turns into the child marriages the third important reason is the social mobility we understand that in our society marriages are not just considered as an emotional bonds they are also considered as the socio economic ties between different families so as soon as the family gets the better option to tie the knots of their children with the better family they soon get their children married the fourth reason is associated with the insecurity again National Crime Records Bureau suggests every year that the assaults against women are rising and a very high proportion of these assaults are against the unmarried women so that is why in order to feel secure families tend to marry their girl's daughter to someone else so that that family can take care of their daughters so the element of insecurity and social prestige is also there the fifth reason is the families tend to avoid the share of women in the ancestral property because we understand that when any person grows for example let's say i have a daughter and a son so when both of them will grow they will they will get aware about their rights in the ancestral property and the social customs in which we live in most of the india we recognize the rights of our sons but we do not recognize the rights of our daughters so that is why we tend to marry our daughters earlier so that they cannot raise their voices in the ancestral property so most of you might have guessed it right by now whenever we have to talk or discuss about the child marriages or we have to think about this particular issue despite the fact that this issue is common to both boys as well as girls but when it comes to girls this issue increases its gravity the severity the degree of intensity rises in the problem and that is why the most of the ill consequences of this child marriages are borne by daughters not the sons and the last reason is the legal complexity now i have written this as a last point but this is one of the most important reasons for the child marriages i have written it in the last point because we need to discuss this particular point in much detail So now we shall discuss certain laws related to child marriages and how these laws are in conflict to each other. So let us discuss this. The first general law is the Prevention of the Child Marriage Act 2006 which we have discussed according to which a girl if she is below 18 years of age cannot marry and a boy if he is below 21 years of age cannot marry. If any one is married that marriage will be considered as null and void now this is an important point 
However, there are certain tribal areas which have their own customs and there are certain personal laws as well, which are an exception to this general law. For example, Muslim personal law allows the girl to be married as soon as she attains the age of puberty or in general we can say as soon as she attains the age of 15 years. Now the case went to the Delhi High Court and Delhi High Court has upheld this Muslim personal law. Now this is one important issue because Delhi High Court has said that according to this Muslim personal law, Muslims can marry their girls as soon as they attain the age of 15 years. Similarly, various High Courts have also upholded the rights to protect the tribal customs and that is why in certain tribal areas, the girls and the boys both are married below the age of 18 and 21 respectively. For example, we discussed the state of Jharkhand. Then comes an important observation by the Punjab and Harana High Court. Punjab and Harana High Court said that prevention of the Child and Marriage Act is a general act and Muslim personal law is a special act. And whenever there is a conflict between the general act and the special act, the special act will overrule the general act because the special act was made taking certain considerations and exceptions to the general act. That was the very purpose of the special act and that is why the special act will overrule the general act. So in this way the Punjab and Harana High Court also recognize the rights of the Muslim personal law that they can marry the girl at the age of 15 years. But then comes a conflicting judgment by the Allahabad High Court. Allahabad High Court has said that whenever there is a conflict between the constitutional laws and the personal laws, it is the constitutional laws which will overrule the personal laws. That means the constitutional laws have higher weightage when it comes to the conflict with the personal laws. So by Allahabad High Court, we understand that this Muslim personal laws should be reformed in order to respect the spirit of the constitutional values. Then there is one more opinion in this regard by the civil rights activists. They say that even if we are following the Muslim personal laws, the Muslim personal law recognizes the marriage as the civil contract. And if we are recognizing the marriage as a contract, so it is by the nature of the contract that we expect that both the parties which are entering into this particular contract must sign this contract in their full consciousness by their full understanding. So how can we expect a girl of 15 years of age to have developed that maturity, that understanding, the implication of the marriage and how can we allow any one party to enter into a contract if she is not having that ability to understand the contract. So that is why according to these activists, even if we follow the Muslim personal laws, by this very logic also, the girls cannot be married at the age of 15 years. Then there comes a POXO Act also, which is again in conflict with the Muslim personal law or the tribal customs. Because according to the POXO Act, even if there is a consensual sexual relationship between the people who are below the age of 18 years and 21 years respectively, even that will be considered as a criminal act of sexual harassment or rape. But now an interesting question arises that if Muslim personal law or certain tribal customs are allowing the girls to be married at the age of 15 years, and if the marriage is solemnized, then whether the POXO Act can be applied against the husband or not. So, there is a legal conflict between this POXO Act as well as the Muslim personal law. There is a legal conflict between various judgments of the Delhi High Court, Punjab and Harana High Court and Allahabad High Court. So, that is why it is said that Supreme Court must intervene and must address all these legal issues related to the child marriage. Now, we shall look at the way ahead. The first and the foremost step which must be done is the education. Because education brings the attitudinal changes and these attitudinal changes are within the girls, within the boys, whosoever is getting educated. And once there is an attitudinal change between the girls and boys, they can raise their voices against the practice of the child marriage. The second important step should be continuous awareness and sensitization programs. The training programs must be conducted at the local rural block and district levels. 
these training programs must include the local administration ngos and other civil society organizations with them so as to instill the feeling of sensitization towards the rights of these young girls and boys the third important step is that grassroots child protection workers must be strengthened these workers can be from the local police these workers can be local health workers these workers can be from the certain civil society organizations also but the child protection workers must be strengthened at all the local levels so as to report the local authorities if they come across certain practice of the child marriage in their local area and by this we come to the fourth step that is the law enforcement the district law enforcement authorities as well as the state authorities must enforce the laws which are there in place they must not come under the pressure of the society or the locality where they live in because this is one of the most pressing concerns which india face so they must enforce those laws and the fifth is at the level of government the government must come up with certain policies which incentivize the later marriage for example there might be some conditional cash transfers certain support in the girls education for example government has started various schemes for example beti bachao and beti padhao andolan so these are certain schemes which government can take at their level in order to protect this child marriage issue so this was a pretty lengthy topic that is why we will be revising this topic in brief once again so initially we discussed that what exactly do we mean by the child marriages and who is actually a child in india as per the prevention of child marriage act 2006 then we came across some of the disturbing facts and data related to the child marriages in india and we also saw the regional variations across various states for example in jharkhand assam mp rajasthan haryana then we came across that what are those reasons which are still continuing to push the child marriages in our society and these reasons were related to the poverty patriarchal setup social mobility feeling of insecurity among the parents avoiding the sharing the ancestral properties and the legal complexities involved when we discuss the legal complexities we also discuss that what are the various conflicting judgments by various high courts what is the conflict between the poxo and the muslim personal laws what is the conflict between the general act and the special act and that is why in this regard towards the end we discuss certain steps or way ahead which can be taken in terms of providing education awareness and sensitization program grassroots child protection workers law enforcement and government incentives to stop the practice of these child marriages this topic has appeared at page number 9 in today's the hindu daily edition the topic reads modi flags off the world's longest river cruise from varanasi to dibrugarh now as you can guess from the topics heading that this topic is related to the inland waterways development in india and this is the very immediate context of this topic the topic says that mv ganga vilas which is the world's longest river cruise now this point is to be noted this is very important mv ganga vilas is the world's longest river cruise which has been inaugurated by prime minister narendra modi which is to travel from varanasi to dibrugarh this is done in order to give a boost to the tourism sector in india and to promote the inland waterways now even if you go by the upsc scheme of syllabus this topic finds its relevance under general studies mains paper 3 in the economic development because this mentions the micro topic infrastructure which explicitly mentions energy ports roads airways railways etc now because etc is written so obviously the other modes of transportation and communication for example waterways also come moreover in previous year upsc has already asked the question related to the waterway development and at this session we will discuss all the major dimensions associated with the waterways that is the benefits issues as well as the government steps taken in this regard but before coming to this particular write up we shall go to the interactive video lesson and we'll have a brief historical background of the waterways and the associated dimensions now we all know that for centuries rivers have been used as a medium of transportation of people goods as well as services 
and we are also aware about the fact that just this century ago river ganga was a very busy waterway but with the advent of the modern technology including the railways the waterways gradually lost their relevance however today the things are getting changed at a very fast pace waterways have proved themselves to be cheaper and greener alternatives compared to railways as well as roadways and many developed countries today including us netherlands germany and china are investing and using their waterways extensively in this very direction the government of india is also taking a lead in order to develop sustain and strengthen their waterways and in this very regard government of india has taken numerous initiatives for example you must have heard about the sagar mala project which builds its pillars on the development of port as well as the associated inland waterways further recently government has also come up with the maritime vision 2030 Moreover in 2016 the government of india notified 111 national waterways before that we had five primarily national waterways that was 1 2 3 4 and 5 in 2016 106 new waterways were added further the government have also taken up the project of jal marg vikas pariyojana with the help of world bank Now World Bank is also assisting Indian government in order to develop this National Waterway 1 which starts from the Allahabad passes through Varanasi and ends at the Haldia port which lies in the West Bengal. Now the total length of this particular waterway is around 1391 kilometers. Further the government is also investing in developing the multimodal terminals systems in India. For example in the district of Sahib Ganj that lies in the state of Jharkhand India has developed a multimodal logistics waterways and in order to have the proper information regarding the waterway system the government of India launched satellite based river information system further India is also engaged with its neighboring countries for example Bangladesh with which India Bangladesh protocol has been signed Now India Bangladesh protocol routes connects two national waterways that is the national waterway 1 and the national waterway 2 you can closely see here that national waterway 2 lies in the northeastern part of india and these two national waterways are connected through the inland water transit agreement between the india and bangladesh now this provides an alternative route to connect the northeastern india Now this map shows that national waterway to connect Sadia in Assam and Dhubri at the Indo-Bangla border. Further, the government have also come up with the development of Roro services that is roll on and roll off services which you can see on your screen presently. Now this roll on and roll off services in Assam has connected both the banks of the Brahmaputra river and you can see the amount of time and energy which has been reduced by connecting the Majuli Islands and the Niamati Ghat Jorhat road. Further the national waterway 3 which lies in the state of Kerala is also of utmost importance. We all are aware about the biodiversity significance of Kerala and that is why we need to reduce the energy intensive nature of the transportation system. This map shows the national waterway 3 in Kerala. Now out of all the notified 111 national waterways 36 waterways have been studied intensively in order to have the required information of those particular waterways and the work of the infrastructure development on almost 8 waterways have already been taken place now the important point is that these waterways are not just relevant from the india's perspective but also in developing the interconnectivity in the whole south asian region For example other than the Indo Bangladesh cooperation India is also in cooperating mode with the state of Myanmar now as you can see here that the Kolkata and Haldia port are been connected to the Sitwe port of Myanmar through which with the help of the Kaladan river the state of Mizoram will be connected and this is how India is planning to connect its northeastern part via its mainland with the help of waterways Now we shall analyze this whole topic in the form of a flow chart. First of all we need to understand that why India is investing so much in its waterways. India is investing so much in its waterways because of its multiple benefits. First we have already seen in the interactive video that the waterways are the cheaper 
and on the same hand greener sides of modes of transportation that means that the per unit cost of operating the waterways compared to the railways as well as roadways is on a lower side moreover the per unit emissions which these waterways give are far lower compared to roads as well as rails now the second benefit which is expected out of the development of these huge infrastructure projects is that it will result in the generation of huge employment moreover it will also boost the india's tourism and hospitality sector further because we all know that waterways are built on the strong pillars of containers vessels ships associated link roads etc so that is why this all thing will require a huge amount of let's say steel coal energy cement bricks etc so in a way development of these huge infrastructure projects will lead to strengthening and boosting of india's manufacturing base also and will help india towards the goal of atmanirbharta further we have understood in this video that in order to build the waterways india is in contacts with other countries also for example bangladesh as well as myanmar and that is why these economic cooperation in today's era builds strong diplomatic relationships and that is how the indian clout as far as the diplomatic clout is concerned is growing in the south asian region further all these steps will help india as we have discussed to achieve its goal of self reliance but despite all these benefits we see that there are certain issues also which are associated with the waterways and the first major challenge which these waterways faced in today's fast moving world is that their pace of movement is far slower as compared to roads and railways you just imagine that if you have to transport let's say goods or you yourself have to go let's say from allahabad to kolkata the roads and railways will take few hours but the time taken by the waterways will be huge the second important natural challenge is the vast rugged topography we all know that india has a highly uneven topography for example this particular region have high and hard peninsular blocks which are difficult to dug upon in order to build the canals through which these rivers can pass and the ships can trespass but these are very hard rocks further as far as this particular region is concerned that the state of himachal pradesh uttarakhand sikkim arunachal pradesh or the northeastern hilly states these are hills whereby it is almost impossible to build the waterways so that means that because of the highly uneven topographic nature of india the waterways have a natural restriction and limitation that they can be built only in the plain areas that is the gangatic plains the brahmaputra plains as well as the coastal deltas these waterways cannot be built across all the land which is available with india and that is why these waterways also fail to provide end to end connectivity because the waterways will be restricted to the stretch of the rivers for example you have reached till this point and you have to move towards this point then you have to depend on road or railways to connect both these points and that is where the role of roro services come into play and here lies an important point the important point is that we should not be dependent only on one mode of transportation that is where the concept of multimodal logistics come into play the multimodal logistics stand that we should build and integrate multiple modes of transportation that is the rail road airways as well as waterways The next important issue is the potential damage to the aquatic ecosystem because when the ships will continuously move in the rivers because of their sound because of the introduction of their ballastic waters multiple invasive species can be transported from one place to another and the release of their ballast water and these invasive species can hurt the ecosystem up to a huge extent further there are always the chances of accidents as well as the oil spill and the last again major challenge is the river flows now we know that the rivers of the peninsular india are seasonal in nature which is mainly relevant on the monsoonal waters 
But again, we also know that the monsoon in India is highly erratic as well as uneven in nature. So that means that the river flows are not continuous and the discharge in those rivers fluctuate up to a huge extent as per the season. And almost similar are the challenges which are faced by the northern river also. Though the northern rivers are perennial in nature, still up to a huge extent they are also fed with the monsoonal waters as well as the glacier waters. Now in the backdrop of climate change and the growing erraticity of the monsoon, the glaciers are also melting. So now the question is hovering around the long term sustainability of these waterways. So these are certain issues which are associated with the waterways development. And in order to cope up these issues, the government of India has taken multiple steps. We have already discussed these steps in the video session, but I am again repeating it for you people just to memorize these steps now and now only. The first step was that India passed the National Waterway Act 2016 through which it notified 111 national waterways. Further, in order to tackle the challenges of the accidents as well as the collision, the government of India has developed the river information system which uses the network of satellites in order to have all the information which is required. The third, with the help of the World Bank, India is also engaged in the development of the National Waterway 1 that is the Jal Mark Vikas Pariyojana. Further, with the help of the Maritime Vision 2030 as well as the Sagar Mala project, India is integrating the inland waterways with its port facilities in order to develop a strong multimodal connectivity. Further, as we have already discussed that India is also engaged in international cooperation with these countries of Bangladesh as well as Myanmar in order to overcome the geographic challenge of lack of connectivity between India's mainland as well as the India's northeastern part. So these are the major dimensions that it the benefits, challenges as well as the government steps as far as the India's waterways are concerned. This topic has appeared at page number 6 in today's The Hindu Daily Edition. The topic is in relation to the deep fakes, an emerging issue in the field of artificial intelligence and breaching the right to privacy of the people. So the author in this entire article has brought out the context that lack of proper legislation on the adoption, use and misuse of deep fakes has made it a potential tool that can threaten national security and jeopardize the individual's privacy. So not only from the individual's perspective but from the perspective of the national security also, this new and emerging technology is very dangerous. So in this relation today we will be discussing the major dimensions associated with this particular technology. So this was one of those pictures which got very famous. So now as you can see that here this one is the original picture and this one is the picture which is created by the deep fake technology. A normal human person has taken the face of a very famous celebrity and has added it to his own physiology. And this is how he has created his own image which is very much in resemblance to the original celebrity's image. Even you can pause the screen and see that how one is unable to identify the differences between these two images. Deep fakes are the synthetic media in which a person in an existing image or video is replaced with someone else's likeness. This uses the principles of machine learning as well as artificial intelligence. Now just imagine about the consequences of this very technology. It can be used against you as a tool to prove that you were the one who has committed some sort of crime. And similarly there can be hundreds of negative consequences or the misuses of these things. So let us see some of the issues which are existing in this particular scenario. First is that there is a clear lack of proper regulations. There is no law which explicitly mentions this deep fake technology and criminalizes the misuse of these technologies. Especially when it comes to India, the legal ecosystem to deal with such crimes is very inefficient. And because there is no proper regulation, there is no accountability and thereby the chances to misuse this technology increase exponentially. The second important aspect is that this technology can be used to spread misinformation as well as propaganda. 
For example, the defect technologies can be used to replicate the images of the political leaders and then they can mobilize the whole lot of mob against a particular issue which might be motivated by the selfish interests. The third important aspect is that this technology has a huge potential to invade the privacy of the individuals and can become a tool for harassment. For example, you might have come across several news articles which have clearly stated that the images of several female actors have been taken and have been superimposed on the actors of the adult website. So this is a clear invasion of privacy and can become a mode of sexual harassment also. Further, this technology can also be misused to conduct the financial frauds. Because not only the images, this technology can be used to manipulate the voice samples also. And hence, the voice sample can be used for account verifications and, th and by this, the criminals can conduct the financial frauds. Further, they can be also misused during the election seasons. For example, recently, the Taiban's cabinet has approved the amendments to the election laws to punish the sharing of the deep fake videos or images. These deep fake videos and images are circulated with the help of the social media in order to mobilize the people with a particular ideology. Similarly, this technology can also be used to conduct the espionage activities. For example, the doctored videos can be used to blackmail the government and defense officials. For example, as it was happened in the case of Ukraine-Russian war. So there was a video which was being circulated whereby the Ukrainian president was seen as to instruct his soldiers to surrender before Russia. But it was a fake video and was created out of the deep fake technology. Similarly, this technology can also be used by the terrorists for radicalization and recruitment purposes. In this overall context of the deep fake technology, there is an important key term. This key term can be used in your PLIMS examination. The terminology is liar's dividend. Now remember this word liar. So it was described by two people, Professors Daniel Keats and Robert Chesney. This refers to the idea that individuals can exploit the increasing awareness and prevalence of deep fake technology to their own advantage by denying the authenticity of certain content. So the crux is that liar's dividend is a terminology which is associated with the deep fake technology. As of now, China is one of the very few countries which has introduced regulations prohibiting the use of deep fakes. As far as India is concerned, the existing legal framework does not cater to the deep fake technologies explicitly. However, there are certain minor sections, for example, section 500 of the IPC, which provides for the punishment of defamation. Similarly, section 67 and 67A of information technology punishes the sexually explicit material. As far as the elections are concerned, the RPA Act of 1951 includes the provisions prohibiting the creation or distribution of the false or misleading information about the candidates or political parties during the election period. But as you can see that all these existing legal provisions does not cater to the deep fake explicitly. So that is why India must also learn from the examples of other countries like China in order to introduce the regulations prohibiting the use of deep fake technology. This topic is from the ecology and environment section and has appeared at page number 3 in today's The Hindu Delhi edition. The topic reads that High Court takes the note of the human elephant conflict in the state of Odisha. So as this topic is also making it clear that what is the immediate context of this topic. In our country, the wildlife and human conflict is very common because of the very high demographic load and unmindful encroachment of the wildlife areas. We are converting the blue and green spaces into the concrete lands, which in a way is detrimental to the natural habitat of the wildlife species. And thereby the occurrences of the animal-human conflict is increasing day by day. However, from the examination's perspective, there are certain key facts which you people must know in relation to the Asian elephant which are found in India. 
these key facts will help you to answer the questions which are asked in prelims related to the biological species. So the first fact is that according to the IUCN, Asian elephants are categorized as the endangered species. As we all know that there are several classifications, for example, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, nearly threatened, etc. So the Asian elephants are classified as one of the endangered species. As far as the natural habitats of these Asian elephants are concerned, they prefer to live in the grassland areas, tropical evergreen forests, semi-evergreen forests, moist deciduous forests, dry deciduous forests, and dry thorn forests. That means that a wide variety of the natural vegetation is suitable as far as the living of the Asian elephants are concerned. Now, from the technical ecological terms, Asian elephants are the perfect examples of umbrella species, flagship species, as well as keystone species. So many students are confused that what are these species and some of them also believe that one species can not be umbrella as well as flagship or flagship as well as keystone species. So this is to make you understand that these categories are not mutually exclusive. One species can be the examples of various types of these categories. Now what are umbrella species? As the name is suggesting, what is umbrella? Umbrella basically protects you whenever there is a rainfall, right? So similar is the function of the umbrella species also. If the umbrella species are protected, that means the species within that ecosystem which lie below them are also protected. So that is why the Asian elephants are the umbrella species because their conservation will also protect a large number of other species occupying the same area. The second term is the flagship species. Now what do you understand by the flagship programs or the flagship schemes of the government? Those schemes are very huge which have their own unique value. Similarly, the flagship species are those species which have their own iconic or the cultural value. That means they have certain unique value of their own. The third is the keystone species. Now keystone species are those species which have important ecological role and have the impact on the overall environment. So Asian elephants are the umbrella species, flagship species as well as the keystone species. This is their natural habitat and endangered is the classification of the category provided to them by the IUCN. As far as the society of these elephants are concerned, they have organized themselves into a well-defined matrilineal communities. Now this is very important. Elephants are the matrilineal communities and that is why their herds are also led by the female elephant. They comprise of adult females as well as sub-adult and juvenile males and females. As far as their range and distribution is concerned, this particular map shows the geographical distribution of Asian elephants across India as well as the Southeast Asian region. But out of all these total Asian elephants, more than 50% are found in India alone. So these were the certain key facts related to the Asian elephants which will help you in prelims examination.